Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we dive into it? Um, and we'll start here this evening. Uh, so we are here tonight with uh, master artist Sharon Lynn Williams. Uh, really excited for this Meet Master event uh, where we get to, yeah, get to know a little bit more about Sharon and about what she brings to the members in her mentorship groups. Uh, I know, Sharon, you wanted to focus on sort of the critique element of the, yeah. the mentoring aspects that you do. So, yeah, I this isn't about me. This is about you. So happy to turn it over to you and let you uh, steal the show. Okay, thank you very much. Hello. Um, I know that there aren't very many people in the room right now. I guess it's supper time. I haven't eaten yet. So if you hear my tummy growl, that's why. I'm Sharon Lynn Williams. I live in Calgary. I have been painting for over 35 years and teaching um, probably for about 30 years. And I have been a full-time professional artist for the last 35 years. Hello, Roberta. Hi. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Roberta, did you send me a picture? No, I did not okay. because I, I wasn't um, with it enough. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I do have some that, that my uh, friends have volunteered. People from my mentorship group have volunteered to put in. So we have uh, six paintings we can look at over the hour. But mostly um, I'm here to try to give you an idea about the way that I mentor in in the mentorship group so I have um, I have had five groups I currently have three groups I've been teaching with Masterius since set a year ago September I think right Mike do you remember it's been a while that almost two sounds years. about right uh, I know you've been hanging out with us for a bit now really appreciate yes. that and um, anyway so critiquing is something that I love to do because um my um, skill set and what I bring to Masterius is a strong base of fundamentals. And that's what I like to teach. So in my mentorship groups, I don't do a lot of demonstra demonstration. Um, if there is something somebody needs to know, like a technique or whatever, I will definitely do a demo. I usually maybe do one or two over the course of an entire session. But I'm more interested in having the students bring their own work to the table and strengthen their work. So I'm not interested in anybody painting like me. Um, there's enough competition out there. I don't need any more. Um, so I used to teach watercolor and um, in-person classes here in Calgary. And it came to the fact that my students could paint just like me and people couldn't tell the difference between my work and my students' work. At that point, I said, okay, I'm not teaching like that anymore because I'm, that's not the point. The point is that you all have a beautiful God-given voice that um, I would love to help you um, bring out and strengthen rather than, you know, tell you this is how you paint a tree or a flower or an anything. Um, I want to see how you paint those things. And then I can help you with the fundamentals. I can make suggestions. I can make um, all kinds of suggestions. But when I do a critique, the first thing that I'm interested in, which is why I hope, was hoping that more people would physically be here, because I want to find out from the person, what was your intention? Um, hey, Brandy. Hi. Um, so if I know what your intention is, then I can tell you whether you met your intention just as one viewer, right? Um, and then if if you feel that you didn't meet your intention, and that usually what is what happens when somebody brings a painting for a critique is that they aren't, they think something's wrong, but they really can't put their finger on it. So using the fundamentals of color and texture and shape and value and all of those things, I can help you figure out how to make your intention more clear. Um, we're all at the place we're at in our art. So, you know, if you're a brand new artist, um, I can't say, well, you should do it this way when you don't know how to do it that way because you haven't been doing it long enough and you haven't learned enough that you know how to do that. So try, I try very hard to keep with uh, 
ability of the student that I am mentoring and, and ease them sort of along the path a little bit. Um, I do give homework in my groups. Some people have commented on that. Right, Brandy? <laughs> And, and it's always fundamental homework. It's always underlying the basics. Um, that's where I started my membership in my mentorship groups. And then we move from there, we move on to, you know, all the other things that are involved in being an artist, but I always start with fundamentals. So um, in my mentorship group right now, Brandy is here is she is one of my navigators. And she is a navigator for an us uh, emerging group right Brandy oh, aspiring aspiring okay but they are really established aspiring mm -hmm. well I think that most everybody in that group has uh we have a lot of people who've retired and who have decided to go into the arts and right. have some previous experience so it's a pretty uh it's a pretty unique group it is. It is. And Karen here is in um, another group that I have that just changed their designation from aspiring to emerging. And the reason that I asked them to do that was so that we wouldn't get new beginners coming in and, and where they have missed a lot of that fundamental stuff. So that's why Karen didn't know that. <laughs> she feels like she's a beginner, but she's not. Um, and um, so that's uh, Karen belongs to one of my emerging groups, and I have another emerging group that we've been meeting um, a year now, and um, that's been really exciting. And now, actually, in that group, we are going back and um, hitting some of the fundamentals again, because you can, you know, there's only so much you can keep in these little brains of ours, right? And and sometimes you just need a deeper understanding. So the first time we went through color, I sort of gave color 101. Now we're going back and we're doing color 201 with mm -hmm. them, right? Because they under, they've worked through that stuff and now they're ready. They've moved on to other things and now they need to come back and get a little bit more learning. So that's sort of the way that I run my mentorship groups where we're always coming back to the fundamentals. Um, yeah, so I think it's I think it's pretty exciting. I, I'm excited to see the work that my group is doing is all very unique, um, very personal with their own color, with their own um, brush style and subject matter. And, and it doesn't matter in my group what you paint. It's easier if you don't aren't an abstract artist, because I think that um, as a beginner artist, you need to understand how to paint something you can see before you start getting too conceptual about it, um, just so you have some dialogue, some words to use, right? Um, but I love painting abstract. I do it a lot. And um, I'm thinking I might actually even start a abstract group. So we shall see how that happens. But anyway, um, does anybody have any questions before we dive into the, into the critique? No? Okay. Um, I am just have to give you a little clarification. Um, I am a newbie at Procreate, but Procreate is the, a most amazing tool um, for sharing, uh, doing your critique. So if I stumble and go, oops, oops, forgive me. Okay. So I'm just going to share my screen here. We have you twice. How cool is that? Well, this view, you get all my wrinkles. See, now you don't get my <laughs> wrinkles. <laughs> okay, so here we go. And now I'm going to go and get Procreate here. All right, so um, I want to go back and we'll start with Karen's painting. So this is Karen's painting. I see myself in the corner. Let me know if this lags at all, okay? So Karen, tell me a little bit about this painting. I started, as I say, last night with you, and I'm looking at it with completely different eyes, but we wanted something for over the couch. I love bright, bold colors. Um, I live in Calgary, Alberta mountains, Alberta lakes, and so that's really what I'm focusing on is landscape. The flowers, the brightness of the red was most important to me. Um, 
the mountains I had a lot of fun doing. If you can, I don't know if you can see all the juicy texture in there. There's a ton of texture. Um, the trees, especially on the left, got away from me. Okay. And if you go down into the flowers, you can see a ton of texture in there too. Right. Um, so I was trying to... Oops. Sorry. There I didn't know about editing my picture, you know, um, about shapes and things. And that's why I say I'm looking at it with a whole different view because we covered a lot last night so much. And I'm looking at it, looking at the spacing between the things and what's standing out. I turned it into black and white to try and see what my values were like. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I've, I've done that for you also here. Okay. <laughs> um, so always a good it, place to start. So my flowers were the most important to me um, and they are dark, the darkest. I think that when I look at it, the mountains look mid-tone the same as the middle. So it almost looks like I only have two tones in there to me. Well, um, I see it, you know, being a little darker, you know, down, down here. Um, so, but, but what you really are saying is what you really wanted to show. Were, were you interested really in the lake or were you mostly interested with the flowers in front of the mountains? I was interested in the flowers in front of the mountains. My husband loves the lake. Okay, I get that. I totally get that. And okay. he, he critiqued me on the color until I got the right color that he wanted for the lake. Oh my goodness, okay. All right, we've got <laughs> painting by committee going on. Okay, um, so first thing that I would, I just want to let you guys know and what Karen is referring to is I begin all of my, groups with a shape mapping exercise because I believe that um, shapes are the most important element in your painting. Um, people say it's value, but value needs a container, which is a shape. So we, we, I get my students to look at shape right away so that you start to recognize certain um, repetitions, things that are like if you look at the um, spacing here between, I don't have the right color here, let me just get a different color here. Um, if you look at the space between, you know, these trees and this one, and you know, we have a pretty even kind of repetition. So that that's something, you know, that you might decide that instead of three trees here, maybe having a group of trees here might be a better shape because all of these branches draw a lot of attention to themselves, right? So that is, that is something that, um, that um, I pay a particular attention to. Um, things like intervals, like I said there, or, um, you know, if you've got, I mean, your mountains are pretty good. They're not, you know, heartbeat repetition like this, which I have seen. So that's good. There's nice variation happening in there. Um, so compositionally, um, this is what happens when you have a picture that you and you paint from a photograph without thinking about um, so much about what is it you really want to say. Because right now, what's happening is we're looking at all of these beautiful red flowers. We're paying attention to all of the texture that's happening here. And then there's all this texture in every single one of those trees. So, and then we have this lone turquoise happening here. So our eyes kind of doesn't know what it's supposed to look like, okay? Uh, what it's supposed to look at. Um, now you've got on your on going for you is you've got your red green contrast in the flowers here, which is brilliant. That's you have a, a value contrast here that darkest darks are there. Um, <clears throat> and so we are drawn to that and to the, that bright red is made that much brighter red because it, of its um, proximity to that green. Okay, so those vibrate a little bit. Um, there's some stuff in here. I don't know what this is, but it's distracting. Can you see that? I can and I actually I didn't know what to do there because um 
I didn't have a lot on the ground, so I, I put in some grasses. Right. So, but if we just left it simple, like if I just take this out, in I don't have my apple pencil. I should have my apple pencil out where it is. Uh, I can't find it right now. Here it is. Um, it's probably out of batteries though. Um, yeah. So if we just take that out, look at how much more simple that composition is. Right. We're not yeah. hung up in all of those little. Is this working? No, it's out of batteries. Sorry. So I felt like I had to fill it in. So it's yeah the simplicity yeah. Is better than. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you can have like you've got some beautiful variations in the browns over um, on the far left. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, you've got lots of nice variation there, but those grasses are so far away. Like if you figure that tree is 100 feet tall, like those grasses okay. are three feet. Right. Yeah. No. So it's just added stuff that isn't helping your story too much. Okay. So um, another thing is to look at the shape. Let me give me a color that you might see. If we look at the shape of this shape down here, okay, it doesn't have a lot of in, in, um, interlocking with any of the other shapes. So what we can do with that is we can go and bring in, sorry, uh, let's see, let's get this brown color here. Come on, give me a brown color. Why am I not getting a brown color? Okay, I got a brown color. And if we were to come and maybe dig in, maybe make a, a space, you know, where this ground kind of came in, see how you've got now a little bit of a notch? Yeah. That makes that shape more interesting, right? Yeah. So so that's the power of, of, of what you have available to you in the shape. So even that, and I mean, that was just, I mean, that was just off the top of my head without really thinking about it. Um, you know, maybe we even have another piece where this ground comes in. Look at how much more interesting that is, right? So thinking about what this big mass, what that shape would look like um, would really help. And then I think, um, maybe even simplifying, uh, what color do we want this here? Um, simplifying some of these trees so that they, they're they not holding our attention. Okay. So I'm just gonna blur them out a little bit. See, now I can get past the trees to see the lake, right? So if we look at before, we're getting caught in all of the little contrasts that are in, yeah in there, right? So now we can, we come in here first, that's a big shape, right? It's the biggest shape. So that's great. We can come in and then we can, you know, sort of get past the trees to the lake. And then you've done a really nice job of having um, this back uh, green area here. This is really nicely muted. So we're not getting stuck in there. If you squint at that, or if we looked at the black and white, that's really low contrast, which is great. And then we get into the busy mountains. So I think the same thing I would say here is if we find your dark color here and we decide to just really simplify these mountains because they're not the star, but they're important, right? Um, so we want to have them. We don't want to get rid of them. I'm trying to find there. So if we were just to simplify those mountains a little bit, and I'm not playing, this is brute force, right? I'm not playing with edges or sophisticated anything um, here, but if we look at the white color and we come in and we just simplify some of the stuff, maybe this mountain that I'm playing with right now is your main mountain, which makes sense. And then we just simplify a lot of this other stuff so that this mountain that's here um, is, is the most important. So now look what happens. You come to the flowers, you can go through to the lake. These trees that point up here are awesome because they take us across the lake so that this lake is broken, which is great. 
Um, and then we can get up into those mountains and then you can use some of these cloud shapes um, here and actually use them like pointers, okay? So if you make a shape that kind of has like a pointer end on it, then, then the sky brings you back in. So if we deal with what's happening over here, um, if we look at that and so, we want to have a maybe darker over here. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, so if we just darken this area and take out some of that contrast. So that green there is pretty bright. So if we want to neutralize that green, let's just make it a little darker and a little more neutral. Okay, that's even better. Pulling up a little bit of the greens from the foreground here. Then, then this dark shape here that can then, you know, start to get lighter as it gets to the top, et cetera. Can you see how you can come up through, up through that tree area? Yeah, you know, initially I did have it really dark and then I felt like I needed to add some, I don't know, because I don't paint realism, right. but I felt like I needed to add something to make it more realistic, I guess. But these flowers, like it's amazing. These are blobs of paint, but they look like exactly like flowers. And so that's what that's the kind of painting you want to do. So these trees, if you handle them the same way, where they're farther away, so anything further away becomes less detailed, right? Yeah. And so um, all of a sudden they start to sit back because they have less detail. And by having this much detail in the mountain back here, it, it, it's fighting for my attention. Okay. Right? So by saying the most important things are your flowers, by giving those uh, the importance that they deserve like that, then you can go through to the rest of the painting, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Okay, um, so then this is Renee's painting and Renee isn't here right now. She said that she, this is a study for a triptych. She's planning to have three panels, 24 by 18 inches each. And I went, wow, that, that's pretty impressive. Um, she said she loves the blended strokes of a Georgia O'Keeffe, but she also likes the vibrant strokes of a Brent Laycock. And her own style, she said, is somewhere in the middle. So she was sort of wondering, um, you know, what do I do with this painting? So the first thing that I, I, I want to sort of just bring up the topic of is how you break something into a, a triptych. So she has said that she is going to make three even panels. So if I'm going to, forgive me if I can't draw a straight line with my finger, but let's say one, two, three, okay, more or less. So in a triptych, each of these panels has to be its own painting. So each one has to carry enough information that it could hang all by itself, okay? Each one of these three, all right? So um, that right away tells me, okay, well, she's got some work to do because this one on the very right, doesn't have much interest, right? If we look at the shapes, um, we look at the shapes here, we have, you know, a rectangle with nothing happening in it, right? We've got another, you know, kind of a wedgy rectangle and, and with another rectangle inside of it, we have the water shape, which has a bump in its rectangle. So if we look at those shapes right at the beginning, we think, hmm, those are not very interesting. So what we want to do is try to make these shapes more interesting. Part of the problem in her subject is that this is a coulee. This is a river cut through Alberta. And this is what happens. We have fields and farms and all that kind of stuff up here. And then the water comes in and digs a hole through the sandstone. And, and that's why we end up having, you know, this kind of situation. So how could she make this piece here on the end, how could she make that more interesting? So one thing she could do is because we know where this is and we know that there's farms and buildings and things, she could have even, this is the wrong color, but you know, if she had like a grain elevator, right? 
something sitting on the horizon here that just breaks into that area is something that she could do. Another thing that she could do here is to make something happen with the sky. So if we look at the color of the sky, and let's get a bit darker value here. So if, if uh, bigger brush, if this sky had something going on, right? Okay, again, this is, this is crude because I'm working with my finger here, but even that, right? She could have something like this happening on the sky, which is very interesting. And she could do the same thing. We take her, um, take her coolies here and really, sorry, too big, exaggerate some of this movement that's the darks and light patterning that's happening in here. See, that's grabbing your attention a little bit more. Um, if there was a bit more, you know, maybe shadow kind of thing going on down here, can you see that this is starting to become more interesting? So that's the kind of thing that you need to do in order to make each panel um, more interesting. So if we go back, get rid of all of this stuff that I've done here. Um, as if we look at this in terms of an entire painting, um, this quiet area doesn't bother so much because she's got all of this busy area here. So the quiet kind of calms the rest of this down, but she doesn't have the luxury of having that if she's gonna make this into a triptych. So that's something that she could think about. Another thing she could think about um, is actually, do you really need that much sky if nothing's going on? So she could um, just come and, you know, oops, sorry, take, cut that off, right? And have it more about the land. That's one option. Um, but I, I think something still needs to happen in that sky. So generally, um, when you um, have an area like a sky, uh, if you don't um, grade your color, so I can see some darker color here. I don't know if it if it's just a lighting condition in the photo or whether it really is dark here. Um, but if you grade your paint, um, sky with this much sky, it should grade from top to bottom, okay, where it's darker at the top and it's lighter at the bottom. And that will help you feel the canopy of that sky that's actually coming up and over our heads, okay? So that's one thing she could do. She can also grade it side to side. So that's, that's another option. And you can also do both. So having it grade, if you have a simple sky like this, if you have it gradating um, uh, in both directions, that, that can be really interesting. So if we grab this sky color and we uh, open up the opacity and darken up the color a bit, I hope this will work. Um, you know, a oh, bigger brush. Okay, so if we, you know, we've got some darkness happening over here, right? So that this is grading. Um, I don't have lots of tools to play with edges in this, but you kind of get the idea, right? So that it's darker up at the top and then it gets lighter as it moves to the bottom. And it also gets cooler as it moves to the bottom. So cooler and lighter. So if, whoop, that didn't do it though, did it? Um, Anyway, so like a cerulean color, you've kind of got a cerulean color in there. So if you think about moving your sky, it's if you look out on a, on a, a day when there's no clouds it's and you look straight up ahead, it's quite ultramarine blue. And when you look down towards the horizon, it gets like a light cerulean. So that's the kind of effect that I'm talking about. And then the same thing happens in the water. So if the water... I need to get this color now. If the water also grades from dark here to light there, it can do that, or it can go from here and be darker here and get lighter, get lighter when it comes down here. 
Okay, so that's another option. If you go from light to dark in this gradation, see how that pushes you into the picture by having that darker color here? So that, that's an option. Um, you, can, you can do it either way and it doesn't matter. There isn't a right or a wrong. Most people will always go from dark to light. The problem with going from dark to light is that if you have a dark happening here, you have a lot of contrast here, right at the edge. And that can really take your viewer out of the painting. So often in these kind of cases, I much prefer to have the this thing get light, uh, darker as it moves. That's too dark, but anyway, you get the idea so that you're, you're forcing your viewer up the river, okay? Um, and then the, the last thing I think I would say about this is that the green, hang on, get a smaller brush. The green that's here, oh, come on, give me a brighter red, bright red, so we can see it. The green that's happening here, going on, ah, opacity. The green that's happening here is the same green that's happening here. So in the same way that if this color here is the same as the color up here, it's like a wall. It's the same color and it wants to stand up so that the trees back in the background aren't receding very much. And if you look at the yellows, they're the same as the yellows in the foreground. So the color isn't moving back uh, in space. So generally, I'll give you a little bit of a, of a rule, okay? So things that are in the foreground, uh, let's see, bigger, a little bigger brush. In the foreground, Ooh, that's really big, are lighter and they're, oops, sorry, undo, undo. They're not lighter, they're darker. Okay, things in the foreground tend to be darker. Oh, sorry, I lost my color. I'm really not very good at this, but I will get there. So things in the foreground tend to be darker. They tend to have more detail, okay? They tend to be lower. <laughs> lower in the, in the in the picture plane, right? And they also are brighter, okay? So we have darker, which is a value, brighter, which is an intensity, detail is texture, lower is aerial perspective, um, and um, so the color is also more saturated, okay? So it's warmer, so it's warmer, brighter, and darker in the foreground. And conversely, as things move away into the distance, they become lighter, they become duller or less intense, and they become cooler. And that's from the effect of having um, the water droplets that are in the atmosphere that we see as blue. So things that are moving towards the distance, they get lighter, they get duller. This is D for duller, not D for darker. Um, they also have less, less texture or less detail, okay? And they also are higher up in the picture plane, right? So that's a really quick rule for how to make something appear closer and how to make something fit, uh, appear further away. So following some of those rules, I think will really help to make this painting quite a bit stronger and um, be able to hone in on the kind of things that that you think you might be interested in saying. And this is for a commission too. So it's gonna be really important, but look what happens when we choose this yellow. Let's choose this brighter yellow here. And give me a brighter yellow. I can do it this way. So if we decide we wanna to move to a brighter yellow, let's even make it a bit warmer yellow. Okay, and we put this brighter color, brighter and lighter, color, so more contrast in the front. So when I said darker, I meant the darks are darker, but they're higher contrast in the front. So let's even move over to, you know, maybe some of these orange kind of colors that are in here. Okay, so if we got this really bright color um, happening back here, just by having that, can you see how that makes these here look further away? because they're not as bright. 
Okay, so con consequently, also, if we look at this, if we look at this green color that's here, and we make that green, we decide we're going to make that green cooler and lighter and duller. Okay, so I'm not sure if I'm going to hit this right away, but no, that's way too bright. So we need it darker. So if we get into this cooler dark back here, can you see how that green looks further away than the green that's up in the front? Because it's warmer in the front. So that's how you can make those, those colors move back to the background. Again, the same brown is here that's is there is that's here. So this brown here could be stronger, more, more concentrated, saturated pigment, okay? Um, have more value contrast. The gullies here could become a violet color. Um, and the violet here could be more pure than, and let it go to this duller brown as it moves back into the distance back here. And then the, the um, hillside where the sky meets the ground over here, if we take that color and we make it even lighter and we put that light way back here, see how it's almost matching the sky color? And that's what happens when you look at something really far away. Like if you look at the ocean, there isn't a strong blue against the, where it meets the sky, right? Sometimes you can't even tell where those are. So that there would add a lot of distance into that into that painting. So I think that that is um, probably pretty helpful. Uh, let's see what time is it, 7.30. Okay, good. We'll do Brandy's next. So this is Brandy's painting and um, lovely painting. Brandy, what was your intention with this one? Just you stop sharing your screen. Oh, I, sorry. Screen. Can you not see your painting here? I can see it. Yeah, in the corner. It was just the iPad was still on um, the last photo. Oh, I'm sorry. If there's That's a bit okay. of a lag. Sorry. So what was your intention for this painting? Um, so these are wildflowers. And I wanted to um, I wanted to highlight that one in the front. But I feel like I didn't get the one. I, I still wanted the ones to be in the back and for it to be messy. Um, so I wanted that messiness and the, the wildness, but I don't feel like I got that. Hmm. Well, I feel like I feel like this flower here is is very messy in turn, and this guy over here is pretty messy too. This guy, um, this guy up here is a little perfect, maybe, mm -hmm. but that doesn't bother me. Um, what I think you did really well uh, in this painting is that you joined these together to be one shape. Okay. And that's really strong, that, that's really great. Often when people paint flowers, they have like these isolated, you know, things like this. And there's, they're all the same shape because they're all the same flower. So mm -hmm. you've done a really great job on this of having, there's no way we're gonna miss that. Um, you know, he's, he's if, if we divide our, painting up into this rule of thirds. This guy's sitting right in one of the prime positions. This guy maybe is a little, could have been a little lower, but it doesn't matter, but he's still up in, in a good secondary position. So I think compositionally this works really well. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if maybe the answer to your messiness might have more to do with edges mm -hmm. than, than it has to do with how you've painted it. Mm -hmm. So, um, cause this line that, that kind of comes in behind, that's quite a hard line. Right. And I wonder if that line was softer, like we don't really, do we really need to see sky there or distance? Right. Is that important? Um, I guess I just wanted to get a sense of, um, dis distance a bit. Okay, well, so I you I could have, know if it's you, really important, but just like I, yeah. I guess I was thinking about but distance. You could have done that in the color because if we look at the right. color here, it's very yeah. similar to what's going on here. Right. So by making that color lighter and duller, 
Mm -hmm. and with a softer edge, this would just float out into no definition, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Because if you paint the way we see, okay, so if you're sitting in the ground and you're looking at this flower, everything over here is going to, is in your peripheral vision. It's going to be really, it's going to be really soft, Mm -hmm. right? So if you're painting from a photo, I can tell because this is as detailed as this is, right? Right. Yeah. So if you sort of think about painting the way we see, then that will really help you figure out how to make a convincing representation to other people. Um, I do like this little bit of orange that you've got back here. I think that carries the colors around. Um, I wonder about even having, one thing I think that would really help this painting um, would be to have a pattern of darks happening in in the foliage because we have a big shape, right? Mm-hmm. I don't think this is a big painting, but that's a no. you know a quarter of the painting, right, yeah. more or less. So there's a lot of place in there that you could play with. So if we just if we grab this dark, come on, let's grab that dark guy. And how big is this brush? Small, and it's okay. So. If, if you were to kind of negative paint between some of these grasses, not everyone, okay, just trying to make a pattern of how um, this might sit in space. So how is it going to relate to this flower? So maybe we have a stronger dark pattern happening here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then maybe we have some kind of rhythmical you know pattern where we where we now are linking the darks right and connect them to the edge okay Mm -hmm. or that can you see now what's happening is is that dark is now pulling us horizontally where the your dominant thing is vertical right right so i think adding this this uh excuse for having this linkage of these darks and i wouldn't do it all in the same color, I would do it all in the same value. And you could, you know, you could come and get this red in the same idea of having a darker red happening in the, in like, maybe there's parts of flowers we can't even see, right? Right. That that can be part of the dark. That's not the right color, but you get the idea. Yeah. So that there's something happening over in this section, but it's not challenging this. Okay. Okay, does that make sense? It does. So I think having something that adds this horizontal because you have quite a vertical, you know, thing happening in your thing because that's how things grow. They have stems that grow vertically. So I Mm -hmm. think that would help. I like the idea of a diagonal. I think maybe if this diagonal was even more diagonal, because okay. it's almost flat there, right. I think a more angle might okay. work. Um, might work really well, and then you could have even it maybe even instead. What if you had that that came and cut in behind, so that then all of this negative shape would stick into the light? Oh, yeah, right. That That'd might, cool. that might, that would be really cool. So let's see what that would look like in okay. my not so great ability at Photoshop, but let's just take a look at this. I should have made sure my Apple Pencil was charged. But if we just look at what might happen if we did this. Okay, so, and maybe we have a little bit here. All of a sudden, this area up here starts mm-hmm. getting really interesting, right? Yeah. Um, because it's against against that other thing. Now that red line, I can't really get rid of right That's now. Okay. But <laughs> I get the idea. <laughs> yeah, you get the idea, right? And then you could have even some of that pattern happening like we ha- had down here. You could have some of that pattern, you know, really close value. Okay, so if we if we look at that color and we have a slightly different color that's the same value Mm -hmm. and it's just slightly different right right so we could even have some other things happening in here um and maybe so 
I would maybe take out the verticals that are here and add some of those green um, stems coming more like more instead of behind there, have them come up, you know, and do their thing coming up through here. Mm -hmm. And if some of those green things actually came in front of that flower, because it's behind, mm -hmm. that now we have depth because okay. we have overlapping, right? So with this system, this big flower over this big flower over here overlaps the sky shape. The, the grasses, come on, undo. Why aren't you undoing? The grasses are overlapping the flower, right? Yep. And then you've got this dynamic di diagonal that will take you down into here. Then you go through this pattern up to this guy. And then you've got this beautiful circular composition going on. Okay. So I think, I think those things might help your painting, Brandy. I think they will. Yeah, good. Okay. Thank you. Um, any comments from anybody else here about the ones that we've looked at so far? Um, we'll look at this one next. Um, this is from one of my mastery students. This is a really lovely painting. She's got a beautiful quality of ethereal softness in this sky that you feel the sky is sky. It's not rock. It, it's very different than the texture that's happening down there. So I think that, you know, there's a beautiful quietude. She thing she's done really well here is she's carried the color from her ground plane into her sky. That's something that you won't see in your photo, but as an artist will really make your work stronger to have the, some of the sky colors in the ground and have some of the ground colors in the sky, okay? So I would be looking in a painting like this, I would be looking for where can I put some of that lighter blue happening, you know, maybe even just a, a couple of little pieces there and then take the same color and move it to darker duller and maybe use it as some shadows in inside some of this stuff. And can you see how the color now moves around the painting a little bit more? So that kind of is a really, is a really nice thing. She has these really far away um, trees. So I'm, I would wonder for this, they're really not helping too much because they're so small. But if she had planted, um, say this group of trees, let's move that group of trees. Uh, come on, give me that color. Where is that color? There. Okay, so if she was to plant, oh goodness gracious. Okay, I'll do it brute force. If she was to plant those trees further down and maybe put them on this plane, then they can also be taller, right? Because they're closer to you. And I think that balance where we've got a big shape here against the little shape here works a little bit better than having them, if I take it away now, have them all be the same, right? See how they're the same? So I think that that would really help. As well, she, that she could have done the same thing with the ground plane. So if we look at, um, if we look at the shape, oh, why aren't you doing this? If we look at, go away. If we look at the shape here, you know, we have kind of a not very interesting shape. So the same thing that I said at the beginning with Karen's painting, if instead of having that, we actually had maybe some, and maybe some grasses that even overlapped, you know, if you, when you take a picture, so this is your viewer's eye line, okay? This is you standing here with your camera taking a picture. That's the horizon is always at your eye line. If you were sitting down in the grass, your this horizon would be lower. So, and the foreground would be higher in relation. So you could actually have grasses that came and actually broke through some of that, which might be, interesting because the flowers have the most detail and they're tucked way down here. So if you were to come and get some of those bright yellow flowers, 
from the foreground and had, you know, some of those, those bright blues and yellows coming and sticking up here, they would cause an overlap of that middle plane and we'd be able to move from the flowers up into the sky. So I think that that, that would help. The other thing that is not helping this particular painting is that the blue in the sky is the same at the top as it is down here at the bottom, right? So by not following that aerial perspective where we work from kind of ultramarine blue at the top to kind of like a manganese or a cer lighter cerulean at the bottom, that causes the that causes that sky to read to a little bit too flat. So if we look at what would happen if we change that. So let's move into more of an ultramarine color, a little bit darker. Let's try that and see what that looks like. A oh, bigger brush, a little less opaque. So if we if 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 we look at what would be the difference if she started to play around with that idea of the color um, changing as it as it moves down into the composition. Okay, see how much more depth that has than what she had by before, just by making the top darker. So I think that that would help as well. Um, and then of course, always back to shape. It, everything, it's always back to shape. So if we look at, if we look at the, sh oh gosh, sorry guys. If we look at the shape, let me, let me take my suggestions away here. Uh, okay, if we look at the shape of her cloud, we have a straight line. So, and then we have, these are pretty straight. You know, these lines are kind of all straight. So instead, if you use the sky as a direction tool, because in any photo or when you're outside, all, you know that all you have to do is hang around for two minutes and the clouds move, right? So clouds are things you can move any way you want. So if we come and get, um, let's see, let's get a really light color here for clouds. Where will I find a nice color for clouds? How about right up here? And we started, we let those clouds become pointers, right? Where you've got the light on the clouds, right? And maybe we, you know, change up the arrangement of shapes a little bit, okay? Clouds also follow those aerial perspectives. So the clouds at the top are closer to you. They will be lighter and brighter. The clouds down here will be duller and darker because they're further away, duller and light, duller and lighter, not as bright as they are up at the top. But you can use those cloud structures to start acting as pointers, which if she's got something happening down here, then your eye starts can move around. And if those trees were a little bigger, like I had them before, I don't have this on layers, so I can't toggle layers on and off. But can you see how you could use those um, these elements of clouds to actually help the composition, right? So that's what I think might work well, because right now what's happening is that our eye is shooting right out of the painting that way. Um, so by having some of these interrupts happening and controlling how the color and the value works with the understanding of what makes something come forward and what makes something go backward, um, I think that that would, be, that would be really helpful. So I am going to go back and stop sharing my screen and ask, does anybody have any questions about what we talked about um, in terms of what makes something come forward or not. Yes, Karen. I have a question or a comment on the one that you just did. Huh? When you had the flowers at the bottom and you did, you seem to have the larger flowers close to the middle. I wonder if they should be further over and then because you were gonna make a tree bigger on the one side, should they be opposite? Yeah, I would play around with that. So I have my students do shape maps so that they can see what the shapes look like and they can alter them to fit their um, 
perspective, what they want to say, and then play with those things. What would happen if you did that? What would happen if you didn't? What happened if you did something else? So, you know, when you have a little, you know, a little thumbnail like this that you're playing around with shapes, I mean, it's really, you can make 20 of them in 10 minutes, right? And just because you don't know what it looks like until you can see it because we're visual people. So that's why I have people go and try to move these shapes around. And what would, what would be the impact if you did this as opposed to doing that? So Brandy, I'm pretty sure that in your photo of your wildflowers, your photo was not what your painting looked like. I'm sure you've moved all those things around, right? Yeah, and that's an older painting too. So I think that I didn't do as much of that back then. Whereas if I, you know, I look at it now and I'm like, oh, so even I don't see everything, but I can see certain things that I would have done differently if I had done it. And you know what? That's always the case. I look at my older work too, and I say the exact same thing. And that's why I was saying in the introduction, we're only where we are. So mm -hmm. we do the best with what we have, where we are. And when we know better, we do better, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that applies to art as well. Um, you know, you make small... You make small adjustments now, but doing some of these things, you'll start to see huge adjustments in your work, right? You'll start to see your work hold together better, be more interesting, have less things that are fighting for the viewer's attention, and then you build on those strengths, right? So yeah, that's that's sort of that's sort of the way that I love to help people to try to understand, you know. In a group, like in a master's group, you'll have people at various levels, right? So if somebody like Brandy who's very experienced, and then you have somebody who's a newer artist, they can't compare themselves to Brandy. Brandy's put in the brush miles, right? She's done the work. So, you know, you just, you the idea is to take you where you are and move you, move you along that path. So I like to use an analogy of a ladder. So we're all on this art ladder and we're all somewhere. And sometimes we go up the ladder and sometimes we go down the ladder. But generally speaking, with time, we all move up the ladder, right? So you can't sit at the bottom of the ladder and wish you were at the top of the ladder without climbing the steps to get there. So um, I try to make sure in my group that we, that the students um, do exercises. I'm less concerned with them making beautiful paintings. Um, I want them to spend the time learning. And if you are so fixated on not making a mistake, then you're not going to learn. So I really encourage my students to take a risk, see what happens, try it. If you're working in acrylic, no problem. You can always change it, right? So um that, that works really well. But if you're not willing to take a risk, then you're not ever going to push yourself to the next place uh, where you where you are. So anyway, any any comment, Roberta? You've got, you're muted. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, I just, I, first of all, I have to say that I'm not group shopping right now. That's okay. I actually just came to meet you and, and see your studio. And I've seen you in... Uh, you know, various events, and I've enjoyed uh, listening to your comments and, and ideas. And so I just came along just for the, just for the company and to hear, you know, what you had to say tonight. Yeah. So um, Brandy and I were just in a group together. We just parted ways. Uh, Brandy went to one. Okay. I'm still, I'm still with Doug Swinton, and I'm also <laughs> with Mark Grandbois right now. Oh, uh, just good. newly, just newly, just moved there. So um Great. So I've kind of got my hands full as far as groups go right oh, now. Oh, absolutely. And this this isn't really meant to be a group shopping activity. This is just, you know, can I volunteer to come in and help everybody just move their work a little bit? Like, mm -hmm. I have, I'm happy with the, my groups the way they are. There is room in all of my groups, a couple of spaces, but they're happy where they are sitting right now. So um, yeah, it's not about group shopping. It's about just being able to speak into help everybody just move a little I bit. I could, if you want, and I, I think you're probably drawing to a close, but if you want, mm -hmm. I could share one of my recent paintings in the chat. Um, I don't yeah. know, can she? It's eight o'clock. Oh, it is eight o'clock. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
should have yeah. asked earlier. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming, you guys. And I hope that this has helped and given you some ideas to move your work further. So thanks okay, for thank coming, Brandy. You, you bet. Thank you. Take thank care, you. guys. That was really helpful. Uh, I'm glad. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.